we need civility. That's it. We're not meeting together as much as we used to. And that human connection um, is causing some frayed ends in society. When you're online, there's that separation that starts to make you wonder what trickery is going on, what um, underhanded things are going on. And we want to tell board members it's not their association alone. This is common things we're seeing all across the country. Common Sense for Common Areas exists to help all 2 million HOA board members nationwide have the right information at the right time to make the right decisions for their future. If you're a board member, that's you. Stay with us weekly for actionable insights that minimize stress, avoid catastrophes, and protect your property values. This episode is sponsored by three businesses that care about volunteer board members, Association Reserves, Community Financials, and Kevin Davis Insurance Services. You'll find links to their websites and social media in the show notes. Hello, I'm Robert Nordland of Association Reserves. Hi, and I'm Kevin Davis of Kevin Davis Insurance Services, and this is Common Sense for Common Areas. This is episode number three, and today we'll be discussing the changes to our industry post-COVID, a review of the impact that this worldwide pandemic has had on board members and community association living in general. But before we get started, in case you have not had a chance to listen, I want to encourage everyone to check out our last episode, number two, which was a great discussion with Evan Hansel and Roger Winston of the Ballard Spar Law Firm. And the topic was association termination. Basically, it's an emergency exit strategy for associations. But back to today's episode. This is a continuation of the conversation Kevin and I had in episode one, where we introduce ourselves and our motivation for creating this podcast for board members. So, Kevin, you had some observations you wanted to share about COVID changes. What's on your heart? I, I'm thanks, Robert. This is a, this is something that. I, we're seeing that um, surprises me. What we do at Kevin Davis Insurance Services is evaluate risk. We get all these applications in for condominiums, co-ops, homeowner associations, and we have to determine which ones we should insure, which ones we shouldn't insure based on a series of questions. And what we've been seeing lately are things that really concern us in terms of what's happening in these community associations. More, it's, a, it's a level of intensity that we're seeing that's higher than we've seen historically. Meaning this, we look at the board responsibility to enforce the, enforce the rules, um, to budget successfully and maintain the common areas. But we're seeing now there's a little bit more is happening in there. Um, as a result of those three things, is gravitating now more to harassment, mm. bullying, and discrimination. Yeah. 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 It's, that, it's that intensity level that's gotten to the point where we're seeing these things. Now, there's always been bullying and things in community association, but now it's been hype. And, and I have one word that really kind of what we're seeing is confrontation. You know, we've never seen confrontation like we've seen this before, and we've seen a lot of it now. And that's been the one thing that we've seen since COVID. Okay, well, uh, walk me back. Uh, COVID was first part of 2021. And it came upon us suddenly, and all of a sudden, our worlds shrunk. Well, we had to stay home. We had to figure out how to get groceries. We had to do all these different things, and that caused tension, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that at a community association where most many, um, many people leave every day, go to work, go to the park, go to school, whatever they're going to, all of a sudden, they're in close quarters. So this is just... Uh, putting a lot of pressure on community association living, which is shared living. That was a rapid change. And is that kind of what's pushing, pushing what's going on? You, you nailed it exactly. We're, we're living closer together. We are on top of each other and we have rules and responsibilities now to have to follow that we didn't have to follow before, like in terms of using the gym, using the pool. But now we're in a post COVID world. Some of those things haven't changed because of one thing, we're still home. Okay, we're still working from home. We didn't go back to work. And just think about how it used to be. We got up every morning, went to work, went to our offices, and came home at dinner, maybe watched Netflix. And we've seen our neighbors maybe on weekends at the pool or maybe in the gym or something. Now, we're having the two o'clock in the afternoon. 
Now you're at home, you open your window up, you're looking at your window and you're seeing something you don't like. You know, you see somebody smoking, they shouldn't be smoking. You see the roof hasn't been repaired yet, even though they have special assessments. You see the landscaper hasn't really trimmed the trees the way you should have trimmed the trees. You're seeing things that you don't like. You see them suffering the problem. Yeah, you see someone walking their dog and not cleaning up after the dog. That's it. And <clears throat> those things. Hey, um, I, the way you're talking about how life changed, I get a reminder from the company that services my car, and they're saying it's time to come in to yeah, get your oil change. And I went and checked the mileage on my car, and I'm only halfway there. Yep. I'm just not commuting. I'm not driving. Yeah. Um, well, not as much. There's people who are going into the office a few days a week, but uh, so many things are different. I hear college enrollment is different. Community colleges are different. So many things are different now. But I, I, I think you nailed it, and that's what's happening is that it's a societal change impacting all of us, but it's impacting community associations because we live here and we have the emotional attachment to this place where, and we see it, and we see the distrust we have for institutions. We see the same thing, the distrust we have for institutions and community associations. Right. And that takes us right back to our motivation here for doing this podcast is that board members are struggling and the, the rapid changes around them. We just want to make sure, well, you're in a, a position to see you write a lot of directors and officers liability policies. And so you're seeing board member changes. You're seeing board member uh, pressures. And I'm in a reserve study side of things. So I see people, as you said, looking out the window and seeing the roof doesn't look good. The paint doesn't look good seeing things that they didn't see before and there's pressure and we just want to help board members understand how the world is changing we can help from our point of view it's not just them it's associations all across the country the the pressures and then you can add other factors uh, we started to see shortages uh, supply chain issues and that started to make prices a little bumpy um, it was more expensive to get this or that or the other thing and uh, just so many, so many different changes. But uh, talk to me about, well, technology. How has electronic board meetings changed the tone of what's happening in a, a board meeting? Does that allow people to be a little more confrontational when they are not sitting next to the person? It, and exactly, we are confrontational under all conditions. And what happens these board meetings is, is that are they valid board meetings? Are we to consider this ballot? And, and, and the biggest problem we've had is there people are challenging the board meetings. You know, but it's interesting. You know how a couple of years ago when we had election denialism, right? We right. have the same issues today in community associations. I mean, whatever society is saying, we're seeing the same things in community associations. We had a lot of board meetings online that were challenged later on and said this board is not the approved board by the association because they didn't comply with the document, they didn't comply with what we think they should be doing. And so now we're seeing something that, again, we don't, we don't normally see. We have two boards of, boards of directors. They're issuing rules, challenging authority, in order to think that they that they think they're both are in charge. And we're looking at it going, so when that claim comes into us, what we have to do is say, which one is the true board so we can defend the true board and not the other board. So we're seeing these things more and more that we haven't seen before. Do you remember Seinfeld episodes when they had that um, Boca del Vista? When yes. They had, yeah. Well, we see right, that right. every single day. That was funny back then. Yes. Not it, funny today. Yeah. yeah. Um, boy, I, I'm, I'm thinking here just the craziness of contested elections, two boards, multiple boards, and I guess they're challenging who has the authority to make the rules and who has a short authority to fight the rules, all those kinds of things, and that falls yeah. right into your lap. And again, for us, it's a matter of a claim comes in and who do we defend? Which one is the legitimate elected board of directors? And until we find out, they both get um, a set of lawyers to, to help them out, which it can be, you got you know, five board members on one side, five board members on the other side, and you may end up with four or five um, lawyers so you have conflicts all between there. This is something that we've always seen, but it is heightened because of COVID. We're seeing things now that are just that before we go to as an aberration, okay, we had one here. It is a lot. Whatever happens in society is happening now in community associations. Uh, you know, you think about 
how we live in a 50-50 world, right? So you live in a community association. You got the other half doesn't like what the other half is doing, no matter what it is, you know? If I don't like your politics, if you're the president or you're the vice president, whatever it is in your association, I'm not gonna like any decision that you make. Any decision you make is wrong. You lack the authority. You know, you don't have the ability to do it. You don't have the power. So we, this is the kind of things that we're seeing today. And we don't know what to do as an insurance professional, looking at ways to, how do you rate for these things? How do you charge money for these things that are just something that you can't, I can't ask a question in the community association and say, do you have somebody who lives in there that doesn't believe in your politics? You know, do you have somebody who lives there who disagrees with you? Because the answer is going to be yes. So it's complicated. It's really complicated these days. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking we were, we were brought up to have some measure of social what decorum. And so when you're in a room, you know how to be polite, you know how to shake someone's hand, look in the eye, uh, be quiet when someone else is speaking, be respectful, those basic things. But when you're online, there's that separation that starts to make you wonder what trickery is going on, what um, underhanded things are going on. I just signed the proxy for the election at my association. It's a uh, June 30th association. And the invitation was, uh, I had the open invitation to uh, go attend the meeting, of course. And I got a half of a sense to actually show up, but I know the president, I know what's going on, I trust him. And I'm just thinking that's an interesting situation because like you said, I know the president, I trust him. It was very easy for me to sign that proxy. If I had any kind of uncertainty or uh, concern, I'd probably be there live. But then again, that's live. Our association doesn't do, and it's a simple enough association. It's just been simple and to show up in person. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think you nailed it. And it's two words, lack of civility. And that's what you said earlier, lack of civility. So we're not kind to each other, right? And a lack of trust. So there's distrust happening out there. Now you're fortunate because you know your board members, you, you trust them. Even if you did know them today, there's distrust going on. It uh, just natural, and especially if we were on a Zoom, I'm looking at you. I can't, I can't see your eyes. I can't see your smile. I mean, I see you smiling, but there is something, you know, there, we know each other. So the trust is right. there, but somebody else on there, do we trust them? You know, it, it naturally right now, because of COVID, that everything's been heightened. You know, we have distrust there and there's lack of civility. And I think you just nailed the two things that we're seeing that's creating a lot of the problems. Yeah. Well, it's reflected in the media around us. We have uh, lawsuit challenges politically. We have a little bit of distrust, a little, a lot of distrust in our go elected government officials. And like you said, uh, whether we like it or not, that gets reflected in board members. If we see it in the big guys, well, just like a kid who watches Major League Baseball or the NBA or WNBA or whatever they're watching, that's who you start to, you start to dribble like that person. You want to swing a bat like that person. You want to uh, kick a soccer ball like that person. And I wonder if subconsciously we're now getting infected by what we see in the news that there is that tension that adds to, oh, uh, maybe we're not outside as much and seeing the people in the hall where uh, you, you see someone who say, oh, you know, they're the board member. Or I remember ages ago when I ran for the board, I would knock on people's doors and say, hello, I'm Robert. Uh, we're going to have this election coming up or this special assessment coming up. You know, we could do things face to face. And that lack of face-to-face -face is, um, wow. Um, yeah. My wife and I started playing pickleball. And oh, pickleball. Wow. We, we got a, a email from the uh, club and they were encouraging us to invite more friends. It's not like a membership drive, but their, uh, their motivation was because we need civility. We need social relationships. We're not bowling as much as we used to. We're not doing other um, normal bridge clubs, things. We're not meeting together. That's it. We're not meeting together as much as we used to. And that human connection um, is causing some frayed ends in society. And then you add the tension, the tension of yeah. uh, inflation, the tension of supply chain type things where the board is perhaps in your uh, situation trying to fix that roof, but they're having a hard time getting proposals. And once they do select a, um, a provider, 
then that provider says, well, it's going to be a two week delay because I can't get the, the flashing. I've got the roof material here ready, but I don't have the flashing two week delay. And then everyone is suspicious, you know, your word concern. Um, well, how come that roof isn't, doing, what are they doing with my money? Um, <laughs> I thought they told us it was going to happen. So uh, you add other, uh, financial tension to the question and that just, uh, and we want to tell board members, it's not their association alone. This is common things we're seeing all across the country. And they're still not budgeting correctly. You know, they're still trying to keep the assessments low. And I know much more money I'm spending with gas and electric and my house, you know, the heating and everything has gone up. And so I know living in a community association, my expenses are higher because I'm at home. And so, the, you know, the lights that don't normally, and, and the, using the use of the gym and facilities, they're being overused. And we know that the landscaper wants more money and the people, the magic company wants more money. So inflation has risen to the point where um, it's hard to hard to maintain without budgeting properly. And we know that these associations still don't budget the correct way. They still come in and say, guess what? Assessments are still low. Don't worry about it. Assessments are still low. Yeah. Congratulations. We've held it for the eighth year in a row to uh, yeah. the same level. For the people watching on YouTube, I'm crossing my arms. I'm getting all tense here myself just talking about this. But um, yeah, tension around. Um, we see the cost rising and then the boards trying, going for that kind of false, it's a, actually a destructive goal of keeping the assessments low. That's not the objective. The objective is to maintain the association, sustain the association. And just said, uh, so that just additional tension. We have a whole list of ideas for what we want to do in future podcasts. And we need to reach out to some management types and some financial types and talk to them about, um, well, having them on as guest experts and maybe even call them up and get them live sometime. Say, what do you think about this? How are your associations dealing with this? And I, I, you know what? I, 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 it is right now, the reason why we, do what we do in terms of helping associations. Is this what we do? We pick up the phone, we talk to managers, we talk to lawyers, we talk to bankers, because we see something that needs to be done a little bit better so they can live a little bit better. That's what this, to me, this was all about. Is, you know, I see these things daily and I'm looking at, oh, they only would understand if they look at the documents and say that the documents allow me to do X, Y, and Z. That the documents allow me to say, I'm going to find you and, and do it, and they do it consistently, they would be a little bit easier. Their life would be a little bit easier versus somebody yelling, screaming at them and say, okay, I'll let you go this time. Okay, I'll let you go this time. Don't worry about it. And how many times does it take for them to let them go before they realize that they have to enforce it? And the lack of enforcing of this person, then you have a whole group over there who doesn't want to enforce the documents, you know, wants to do whatever you want to do. What gives you the right there to have your dog walk through the lobby and not to carry my dog, you know? And what rights give you the right to have a dog and I can't have a dog? I mean, I think, you know, what would be interesting to do, Robert, is to look at the people who live in the associations and say, why, what gives you the right to challenge everything that happens out there? I mean, again, and we live in that kind of society now where we do challenge everything that happens. But if we get to a point in time where, we can get the people who live in these associations to, to agree to live more civilly and to be more respectful of one another. I mean, maybe we need to do is, is put something out there that tells them that this is the way we live in the community association. These are the 10 rules to, to behave better, to be, to be kinder to each other. Because until that happens, you know, we're going to have this distrust. We're going to have, you know, challenging every decision the board makes or the board it doesn't make, you know. That's the one thing too. The board gets in trouble for not making decisions. Also, yeah, you know, how dare you not fix the pool, or how dare you not, you know, buy new pool furniture because the pool furniture has been there for twenty years, and you know they they get challenged constantly, and it's a hard job for these board members who are not, and we said it before, not educated, not well informed, don't have that experience to be able to really understand the responsibility of, of running a multi million dollar corporation. Yeah. Let me follow up on that. We've been talking about civility and the challenges of I'm for this, I'm against this. I think one of my pet peeves, well, I know people who know me, uh, know one of my pet peeves is when someone is known more for what they're against than what they are known for. 
And maybe that's what we need to do, have uh, someone on to talk about uh, code of conduct, code of ethics, and have aspirational um, ideas so everyone at the association can rally around. This is what we're for. We are for a peaceful community. And that's something that sounds aspirational rather than we've got to close down the pool in the spa at 10 o'clock at night. That sounds like what we're against. We are for uh, people doing this. We are for this. And I wonder if that's one of the ways we can begin to turn the tide and have uh, different things that we are known what we are for rather than what we're against. I'm against the board spending too much money. I'm against my assessments going up. What do I, what am I for? I am for enjoying my home. I am for a sustainable home with maximum property values. Uh, Kevin, some more ideas, things like that. Yeah. And this is to me the issue with that. It's great, but we give too much attention to the person who, what they're against. And that's the problem. We need to say, thank you very much. Let's move over this direction. The person who says what they're against, we all turn our chair around and give them all the oxygen in the room. And they love that. And they can keep continuing to give them oxygen. We keep continuing to give them oxygen, keep continuing to give them oxygen. And instead of saying, well, thank you very much. We understand that's your issue. So let's talk about this over here and move the debate back over to there. Uh, but the problem is that we always want to give oxygen to the person who's the loudest in the room. And normally the person loudest in the room is the one that's always against everything and makes everybody's life difficult. Right. Sucking the life, sucking the energy out of the room and distracting us from, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? We are trying to accomplish a, a safe and successful community. We're trying to accomplish one that thrives with uh, strong property values, peaceful, that kind of stuff. And I think, well, hey, a uh, dangerous question. What do you think is the average number of people in a community association that are not well suited to living in a community <laughs> association? You know what? Percentage. It's, it's a great question. And this is, again, we evaluate risk all the time, okay? Okay. Most of the people in these, in these associations are average. And we look at a hundred unit complex and we know there's an average, you know, most of them are average people. And we know okay. most, there's a small percentage of people who are going to volunteer to do everything and a small percentage of people who is going to wreck the place. And it's based on three to 5%. We know hey. three to 5% of the association creates most of the issues you have in the association. And they continuously do it. So, we, okay, so we write insurance for directors and officers, we ensure that. There are a lot of policies that we ensure that we have an exclusion for one individual in there. If this person brings a suit, we're not gonna cover it at all because he is that bad guy in that association. So every association that has one or two, a couple of people in, not more than that, it's not a lot of them. It is just a, a small number of them. However, though, the problem today is that the people who live in them feel they have the right to um, challenge everything that goes on in there. And they don't mean it disrespectfully. We lost the connection that we need as human beings. Um, it's easy to yell at you, somebody, on Zoom. But if I'm sitting next to you and I'm looking at you and all of a sudden I see your pictures of your kids in the back of there and I see, you know, some of the accomplishments you had, you, you automatically kind of, you bring the temperature down. Right. And, and, and we'll be able to listen to each other. We can talk to each other face to face. But here, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's, I can feel like I feel comfortable enough, you know, to say, how dare you tell me that I can't, you know, park my car out in the business park. I've been parking there and who do you think you are? And all of a sudden, you go down that rabbit hole. It's always going to happen. It's not going to change, but what we need to do is not give as much attention to those people in there. We need to kind of move it away from, yes, we understand. We hear what you have to say. Let's move on. Yeah, we, we I, do that. Well, Kevin, I've got a grin on my face because I asked you that question knowing my secret answer is 5% or less. And for you to say 3 to 5%, that was a little bit of validation. But yeah, that, that, there's that same minority that are volunteers, that are uh, people who can run for the board, do well running for the board. And there's the same uh, small fraction of people that can make life disruptive. I was not aware that you had exclusions for <laughs> that that disruptive yes. owner in unit number 13. Yes. Uh, that uh, brings another idea that I wonder if there's a lot of people, as community association living is more and more popular um, and more and more People are living in community association home just because they're the economical way to live. That's the way developers are making new um, new places to live. I wonder if 
we are missing a little bit of people understanding that they are part of a community. Their home is not their castle that they own and that they're like their parents owned. Their parents own their home. Their parents got to do whatever they did. But in a community association, you only have one one hundredth voice in the association. Do you think there's there's a little bit of a, it's going to take a little bit of time for society to catch up with the rapid change in homeownership style where more people have to learn that community association living is, they are only a minority. This is shared living. Do you think that's a factor? Yeah, that's a big factor. You know, when you talk about community associations, again, you have people who live there, they live there for a reason because it is, you know, it, it's cheaper than, than buying, you know, a single family home or um, anything else. But the, the reality is we have to be able to live together, work together and share costs together. So I have to worry about cutting my grass. I have to worry about putting the trash out. You have to worry about certain things that the association takes care of for me. I have to worry about my roof. There's certain things I don't have to worry about. The association is responsible for doing it. However, we are in a selfish environment right now where I care about what's happening to me, how am I being affected, why I'm being mistreated. We are living in a, in a world where we believe all that we're being mistreated, that we're being fundamentally mistreated. And whenever we see something, all we see is proof that we're being mistreated. You know, whenever we look, turn the news on, we see things that we're being, not being treated fairly, not being treated responsibly. And every day we get bombarded by it. We don't see things that are positive. We don't see things that help us to move things forward. We still see enough of that stuff to believe that is even possible today. You know, we just, we, we kind of lost faith. Yeah. Well, I think it brings us back to how we started this episode talking about COVID. And that was a time when the government uh, really struck us with fear. This is a unknown um, uh, bacteria pandemic. I didn't know the word pandemic before, you know, I knew uh, Asian bird flu. I knew the, the black death from forever ago. Uh, those kinds of things. I did not know pandemic and that struck fear in our hearts. And I think starting with fear and then the government and society around us saying, Hey, you need to change your behavior that made us defensive. So you yes. put uh, fear and defensiveness uh, into our hearts and souls. And here we are a couple of years later, uh, still reeling from that. And as you so uh, said so many times here today, we are, in our community associations, a reflection of the environment around us. We see fear and distrust uh, in so many different places. We see uh, bad things in the news. We are concerned for our kids. We are concerned for our health. Uh, news at 11, you know, what's wrong with uh, this thing that we're eating or how to change your diet to uh, avoid all these different bad things. Um, yeah, there's, a, it, it's tough being a community association board member. The world is rapidly changing around us. So I guess what, what we want to say is uh, there's a lot happening. Hang in there. Um, it's not just your association. There's some society trends, but I think, well, that's the motivation for this podcast. I do yeah. what we can to give you board members a big picture idea of what's happening out there. I am encouraged that give society a little bit of time for people to, to better understand the difference between my home is my castle or my home is one one hundredth of the association. And then for the fear that was struck in our hearts a couple of years ago, the distrust from a contested election, uh, there's no denying what that has done to our hearts and souls. Yeah. And I, I think what we're doing here is just making the people aware of what's happening out there. I hope our, t our intent's not to make you more fearful, is to bring awareness to you so that you can go, Yes, this is happening in my association also. We're part of a collective, you know? It's called shared humanity, you know? Right now, we all are suffering. There's a low-level depression that we all have, you know, that we've been having since COVID. Uh, some of us got higher levels, but there's a low level. We, uh, we just feel it. We feel that weight on us. And we're in a community association, and we're seeing people, we're connecting with people, and people we give money to every month. We automatically feel that they're not doing the job they should be doing. Just like when you pay our taxes, we don't feel like we're getting our money for from our taxes. There's not much difference between one and the other. It creates that it creates that problem um, that someday we need to figure out how do we get past it. And our goal right now is to make people aware of it so that we can get past it. Yeah, and build community among 
the, uh, what, 2 million board members across the country. That's a heck of a lot of people. And if we can reach out with a podcast and help, that's uh, that would be fantastic. Well, Kevin, I'm looking at the time. Uh, I would love to talk to you about insurance. I know that's an issue that is on everyone's heart with community associations. It's one of those uh, budget disruptors, but we don't have time for that today. So we'll leave that subject for a future episode. But again, Kevin, thank you. It's always great talking to you. Look forward to the next time I'm back. We hope uh, to our audience, we hope you've learned something from our discussion today that helps bring common sense to your common areas. If you have a topic you'd like us to address or some questions that you'd like us to answer, please call 805-203-3130 or email us at podcast at reservestudy.com. We look forward to having you join us for another great episode next week. You've been listening to Common Sense for Common Areas. Thank you to each of you for your engagement and support. To continue the conversation, you can follow the social media links for Robert Nordland, Kevin Davis, and Julie Adaman in the show notes. If you like the show and would like to support us, you can do so in a number of ways. You can subscribe to Common Sense for Common Areas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And please share it with another board member. You can do us a huge favor by going to iTunes and leaving us a five-star rating and review. And you can also support us by supporting the brands that sponsor this program. You'll find links to the website and social media for Association Reserves, Community Financials, and Kevin Davis Insurance Services in the show notes. But the most important thing you can do is to engage in the conversation. You can email your questions or voice memos to podcast at reservestudy.com or call our 24-7 voicemail line at 805-203-3130. This podcast was produced by Stokelight Video Production and Marketing. With Stokelight on your team, you'll see sales grow as you reach more customers with videos that inspire action. See the show notes to connect with Stokelight. Finally, remember that the views and opinions expressed by the podcast, including host, co-host, and guest, do not constitute legal advice. We encourage our audience to consult with their own legal counsel before making important decisions.